How many of you read Dear Abby? Now come on, you can be honest. It's dark, we can't really tell. Well, even if you don't read it, you know that it is an advice column written by Abigail Van Buren, also known as Jean Phillips. It was founded in 1956 by her mother, Pauline Phillips, whose identical twin sister, Esther, wrote as Ann Landers. But Dear Abby is the most popular syndicated column in the world. Published in about 1400 newsletters or newspapers worldwide with a daily readership of well over 100 million. And it is known for its common sense solutions to everyday problems. Now I have to say that this last section of Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia sounds a little like the kind of proverbial wisdom that might be found in an advice column. Indeed, here we find a series of instructions that are similar to maxims found in Greco-Roman philosophy. 
in this last part of Galatians, he dispels the notion that freedom from the law means freedom from moral responsibility. In all of Paul's letters, there is a message about community and relationships. Here in Galatians, Paul offers practical advice about living in a community of faith, probably drawn from the ethical wisdom of the day, not just tacked on to the end of the letter, but well integrated into the context of the letter. It is clear that Paul has heard of some of the problems they are experiencing in Galatia and is not particularly happy with their behavior. Perhaps someone in one of the churches wrote to Paul for advice. Dear Paul, things are not going so well in Galatia. Rival teachers consider your teachings inadequate and have convinced many that their salvation depends on circumcision and Torah observance. These outsiders say that we have to become Jews first before we can become Christians. Who do they think they are? And worse yet, a lot of people are listening to them. And some are behaving in ways that are unethical. What is really important, Paul? What would you do in this situation? Signed, Desperate in Galatia. And Paul's response might be found here in Galatians 6. Dear Desperate, my friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Notice that Paul focuses on the response of the congregation rather than the transgressions. Those who have received the Spirit, which are all Christians, not an elite group, are to respond with gentle correction and restoration. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. He suggests that the congregation is to share the transgressor's burden of failure, guilt, and restorative work. That is the way to bear another's burden. Now you baby boomers may remember this song by the Hollies. I don't know if that was based on this verse in Galatians or not. But it's a perfect rendering of bear one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ, which is the law of love for one another. And Paul continues, for if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. The implication in Galatians is that the circumcised think they are something, while the uncircumcised are nothing. How foolish it is to compare ourselves to other people as a means of determining our own worth, or their worth, or lack of it. Paul chides their pride and conceit, as well as ours. And he encourages them to take care of those who teach them. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. In his Galatians commentary, J. Lewis Martin compared this maxim to a passage in the Hippocratic Oath, in which the initiate swears to hold him who taught me this art as equal to my parents and to live my life in partnership with him and if he is in need of money to give him a share of mine. 
or in this context, let the one who is receiving instruction share in the support of the one who is giving the instruction. Now, Paul refused to accept payment from the Corinthians, but argued in favor of compensating those who proclaimed the gospel, thereby opening a huge can of worms. But moving right along, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Warning about being deceived by false teachers, Paul reminds them that they can't just thumb their noses at God, that there will be consequences. Some takes Paul's words to be eschatological. In the Gospels and in Hosea, reaping and sowing refers to the last judgment. Considered in that context, these verses offer both a warning and encouragement to persevere. The contrast between flesh and spirit is common, as Paul again exhorts them to invest their lives in the spirit rather than in their own achievements. But there is more practical advice here for us to consider the consequences of our actions. I learned about sowing and reaping one summer when I was home from college. My dad had a small garden, and we decided we wanted to grow watermelons. So we planted a whole bunch of seeds, because not many of them would grow, right? Wrong. Within a few weeks, we were overrun with watermelons. We ate as many as we could, and between my dad and me, that was a lot. Gave away a lot, had a few stolen, and we still had plenty. So be careful. You do reap what you sow. Paul begins to wrap up his letter. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whatever we, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. More encouragement to keep on keeping on. Or as we said in the 70s, keep on trucking. Doing what is right and to Paul that is living in the spirit for the common good. And finally, Paul closes his letter with a blessing, typical of his writing. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The rule to be followed is life of the Spirit. Given Paul's reputation of Torah observance, the Israel of God probably refers to those who follow the rule, namely those who live by the Spirit rather than by the law. Paul's message really boils down to that one point. Live by the Spirit. The result will be that we serve one another through love, carry one another's burdens, and generally do good to all people. Today, may we understand anew the predictable relationship between causes and consequences, between reaping and sowing, for in many ways, we have learned, sometimes the hard way, that when we sow earnestly, when we work for the good of all, and when we bear one another's burdens, all of humanity benefits. So as you go into the days ahead, your relationships with your family, your friends, 
your coworkers, and your neighbors will all present opportunities to sow in fruitful ways, to bear one another's burdens, to make a difference in our world. And in time, you will reap what you sow. Will you pray with me? God of our lives, teach us to sow with compassion and to reap in humility. In Jesus' name, amen.